Welcome to Simon Chartier's New York Stories, Volume 5. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to take, i just taken a set break. I was practicing for my next dive bar show. But, see, there's my baby. But, uh, I'm going to take a little break and tell you a story. And this is, you know, this is me and, and, and hundred, millions of other people in New York, okay? It's the... Uh, the way I grew up, uh, and this, this, the name of this story is Italian Wedding Band. So, I kind of went through this real lumpin, like, long hair, rock and roll, trying to be a hippie phase, and it wasn't getting me anywhere. I mean, uh, I guess I was about 18 and 19, and the you know, I was uh, just knocking around the Upper West Side. I was living in the, f sleeping on the floor in the back of my father's doctor's office, and just kind of being a, a ne'er do well. But uh, I had my guitar and my amp with me, and I was probably just wearing jeans and a T-shirt. It was the middle of the summer, and I walked, probably 1977, and I walked by this synagogue and I heard a band playing inside, right? And they were playing Mac the Knife and they were swinging their ass off. Now I was always a big fan of jazz and I was like, man, these guys are good. So like, I, I don't know any better, right? And so I just walk in and it's a bar mitzvah. So everybody's wearing, and the whole place is wearing a tuxedo or like a, a ball gown except for me, and I wasn't invited to the bar mitzvah or nothing, but I just walk in, and this band's on stage, okay, and it's, they have this plaque in front of the stage, says the Eddie D. Orchestra, and it was a guy playing a Farfisa organ, and he's playing the bass notes on with it, with his left hand, and then a drummer and a saxophone player, right? And they were, they were fantastic. And uh, I'm standing there, and you know, I'm wearing like, like Adidas and jeans with holes in them, and a T-shirt, like probably like a, you know, Budweiser T-shirt or something. So I say to the sax player, "Hey, man, can I sit in?" He goes, "Sure, sure." And I get up and I played with them, right? And they were playing like they were playing all this stuff I knew. They were playing like Glenn Miller's "In the Mood," da 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 da. da. So I, I jam with them. And I played about four songs, some odd songs with them, and then I broke down. You know, I, I don't want to... When you sit in, you should play a few songs and get off before you're asked to get off the stand, right? So I, I'm coming off the stand, and the guy goes, Hey, kid, give me your phone number. Here's here's my card. Give me your phone number. I, I read his, the, my phone number down. He goes, You want a job? I was like, Yeah. I was like, Yeah, hell yeah. And... uh. I called him and he goes, listen, you can't be wearing no jeans. Get a tuxedo. If you don't have a tuxedo, go out and fucking get one. Ruffle shirt, bow tie, shine your shoes. White shirt, ruffle shirt. Get all this shit and meet me on New Utrecht Avenue and 18th Avenue at the subway station. So uh, I go out to Brooklyn. He picks me up. He takes me to my first job. And there was never no rehearsal. So we played all the the pop hits of the day. Like we played a bunch of crap tunes, like to you know, like you needed me, you needed me. And, There's got to be a morning after. And oh my God, was that other one? You light up my life. You give me hope to inject dope. And we did all the disco stuff, like the Bee Gees, you know. Right, so I played with them from 77, 78, 79, 80. So I played with them through four years. And it was usually John Sirocco on drums, Mike DiBetta on sax, and Leroy Earl on the organ. And then Mike's father, Leo DiBetta. And these guys were all fantastic, fantastic, top-rate musicians. And they, they did the whole wedding band thing because they were all New York City public school teachers. 
As a matter of fact, Leroy was the principal of Boys High School in Brooklyn. So, this was like, now, if you don't know a lot about Brooklyn in the 70s, okay, it's a certain kind of culture, all right? It's a certain kind of culture. Uh, it was a very Italian American culture, uh, somewhat traditional and conservative. Like you had to dress a certain way, act a certain way, look a certain way. Uh, you didn't open your mouth, you didn't get out of line. Uh, the mob completely ruled that whole part of Brooklyn, and more about that in a minute. But the mob completely ruled the mob culture filtered down to every single level of society. The mob guys set the whole style, like the suits and the way they talked and the rings and the jewelry and the attitude. The co like, like everybody had a little bit of that in them, you know. So like my boss, Mike, you know, he he would, if he got mad at me if I played a bad note on stage or something or played too loud, he would go, you play like I wipe my ass. Struns, the lowest, the lowest. And then we'd be like, smarten up, kid, smarten up. He'd give me a little smack, you know, not too hard. But now I'm, I'm like a little like uh, half Cuban, half Jewish, kind of like middle class, kind of fartiste from Manhattan. So this was my first time going deep into Brooklyn and being around this culture and I gotta tell you I'm so glad that I did it 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 was like it gave me this a whole other level of understanding life so we go down there and we would play all these you know you had to be dressed up and we would play all these weddings and then we put yarmulkes on and play bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs now I grew up Queens Forest Hills in the building you would see people with the tattooed numbers on their arms they had been in the camps all right and I'll never forget, we were playing Bayswater Jewish Center in, in Far Rockaway, Queens, right near where, where I live now and where my daughter lived and before she moved to Brooklyn. So uh, anyway, we played a bat mitzvah. The bar mitzvahs for the boy, bat mitzvahs for the girl. We play a bat mitzvah, and the grandma is dancing with the little girl. And and we're playing the Miserloo, which I knew I didn't even hear Dick Dale doing the Miserloo yet. You know, remember I was like, I I I didn't know enough about roots rock and roll yet. I mean, I I knew I had my Chuck Berry and my Gene Vincent and Little Walter and Muddy Waters records, and that's about it. I knew that stuff, uh, but I didn't know enough about all the other stuff that I should have known. So. <laughs> And we're playing that, which I didn't know as, as Dick Dale or Pulp Fiction. I knew it as like a Jewish wedding tune. And the grandma's got the numbers on her arms. So we are playing Bayswater Jewish Center, and this lady is dancing with the daughter. She got the numbers on her arms. Um, another thing the guy, Mikey, would get on me if I didn't go to the dry cleaners a lot. He'd be like, clean those fucking cum stains off your pants, kids. Another, another pachi. Another frosk in der pisk. He know, it was like a affectionate thing, but it's like that's the Italian style, you know. He wouldn't like hit me or anything. He just the guy obviously liked me and he wanted to fucking like learn me some things, you know. So he so uh then we played all we played like Bath Beach, Bensonhurst, Gravesend. Bath Avenue, we played this place on Bath Avenue in Bay 25th Street. We played New Utrecht Avenue. I I forget, it was like the Alibaba or something. It was under the trains. It was under the trains, okay? Uh, another thing he used to do is if he didn't like what I was playing, you know, because remember I was still learning music. I mean, I was 17 or 18. I'd been playing guitar for like eight or nine years, but I wasn't, you know, a master musician like he was. He'd get mad. He would just turn my amp off or pull the plug out of my guitar on stage and he would go Gabon maleducato strunzi like right on stage at me right so then uh, one day he, he one day he picks me up in a car and he goes 
and he two fingers me in the chest. He goes, "Kid, today we're gonna go play a wedding. There's gonna be some people there, okay? There's gonna be some." But he did it like this. This is, this is like the evil army. There's gonna be some people there. There's gonna be some serious people there. If they're gonna feed us, they're gonna take care of us. Don't mingle. Don't talk to the women. Don't look at the women. Don't look at nothing. Keep your fucking mouth shut, kid. And he goes, The boys! The boys! And he goes, Bah! He goes, You got it? I was like, Okay, Mikey. So, now, we played the Shalimar in Staten Island. We played the wedding. Then we go back in a back room behind the kitchen and they fed us really good food and everything. We just played the wedding. You know, I just, and, uh, now, I read, many years later, I read this book about the Mafia. It was Alley Boy Persico's wedding, Carmine Persico's son, and, all right, like, uh, the whole mob was there. Jimmy Weasel Fratiano from California, right, Alley Boy Persico, uh, John Gotti, Roy DeMeo, uh, Paul Castellano, Funzi Thierry, uh, Everybody in the mob was there. It was like one of the most notorious mob weddings. It was probably all bugged. It was probably feds all over the place. And I played it. Uh, I used to, I, I was such a, like like uh, Mikey would, t would say, I was such a stunard back then. I learned that word from him. Right? You know, I remember I'm from Manhattan. I learned all this shit from working. And, and uh, I'm grateful for this experience, you know. Uh, you, I was a Stunard. I had a Fender Deluxe Reverb and a Gibson ES-345 stereo hollow body guitar like B.B. King's. And I used to just carry the shit on the subway or the bus all the way to Brooklyn. Like, I, I didn't know to buy a luggage cart or anything, you know. I just lugged the shit everywhere with a tuxedo on. And one time we played this place out in um, Sheep's Head Bay. We played out there a lot, too. Basically, if, if you know New York, you know we played all the mafia-dominated neighborhoods out in the outer boroughs, right? So we play out of Sheepshead Bay, and they were, it, this this was like, these people were real cheap. They were real tight, and uh, the catering hall was real tight, so we didn't get fed. And I was hungry. I had like, I, A, I was a teenager. B, I carried an amp all the way to Brooklyn on the train, right? And Mikey would pick me up at the train, but he, I mean, he wasn't going to go into Manhattan to pick up, you know, Gabon Mala Ducato over here. So I had to go out there with the ant. I'm hungry. They wouldn't feed us. So at the end, I know I, I got a long, shitty train ride from like Sheep's Head all the way back to the Upper West Side of Manhattan. So we're going through the kitchen. I played all night. I was starving. And I see this huge tray of meatballs in, in the sauce, right? And I had, you know, the deluxe reverb, it's an open back amp, right? So I, I had my deluxe reverb, and I just, I stopped. Nobody saw me. I started shoveling meatballs into the back of the fucking amp. Boom, 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 boom. As many as I could go, looking around. And then I went out of the place, and then Mikey dropped me in the train, so I had, like, this three-hour fucking ride on on these graffiti covered trains uh, and I just was eating meatballs out the back of the amp the gravy got all over the fucking reverb tank everything you know uh, this is also where my this your band get him the fuck out of here story comes from so I really uh, you know, I, I had a lot of good experiences. I mean, Mike was definitely kind of a, you know, I mean, if you played a wrong note, he would smack you in the head, you know. I think it kind of impeded me as a band leader because after working for him, it kind of taught me maybe a style of band leading that wasn't really going to fly, like, outside of, like, Bath Beach, you know, or, you know what I mean? But, uh, the the other the other story this is much later but this is the same neighborhood of Brooklyn this is like total back then you know now it's like the Chinatown of Brooklyn but back then it was mob city okay and 
we ran into some little guy. He was like this little sweaty, kind of balding, nervous guy, maybe 90 pounds. And, he, and he's Mikey, and he says, I got an Elvis act. I got an Elvis act. I do Elvis. I'm the best Elvis impersonator in the world. I want you guys to be my backup band. And this is Joey Miserable in the Worms. So he was like, the guy was swinging off my balls. He would call me in the morning, in the night. You know, he, he, he wanted us to be his backup band. He goes, I got this great gig. I got this great gig. Brooklyn, man, we'll do this show, man. It's my cousin's place. My cousin owns this place. It's the Plaza Suite Disco on Avenue X in Bath Beach. And I didn't know how notorious this place was back then. Like, I had no idea. It's like, look it up in the history of the mob. It was like, owned by uh, a really famous mobster, one of the most famous mobsters, and he sold it to some other guy, and the other guy started ordering everybody around and disputing with everybody, and the guy got whacked in his own club the same year that I played there with the Elvis impersonator. So this guy, he didn't look like Elvis, he didn't sound like Elvis, he was just kind of like, baby, let me be your little teddy bear. He couldn't keep time, you know. But we wanted a gig. I wanted, I wanted the 50 bucks so I could, like, buy some dope, you know. So uh, I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So we go all the way out there. We go all the way out there. And we don't belong there, okay. Like, I told the guys in the band, listen, I worked here. I worked in this neighborhood for four years playing gigs. I said, watch out. Don't say nothing stupid. Keep your fucking mouth shut. You have no fucking idea. I said, listen to me. Listen to me. All right? We go out there, and it's like everybody has, like, a black silk shirt open here with the chest hair, the cologne. The guys all got that feather cut hair and mustaches. All the chicks got the 80s big hair and those kind of like pom-pom party dresses. And it's all disco. You know, so... Talk about it, talk about it. It's like, it's all disco, flashing lights. You know, it's like Saturday Night Fever was a good three or four years before, but these guys are still living in Saturday Night Fever. I mean, it's... That culture was predominant. All right, so... We're setting up behind a curtain, and we're going to go on, and I'm like, I got no idea what the fuck was, happens. I just know I want to play the gig and get my, like, my money for a week that I can eat some rice and beans and smoke some weed, you know? So, we, uh, the, this big guy comes over, this big guy. He's very nice, but he, he, he had, like, on a silver sparkly shirt with, with, like, the gold chains, and he puts his hand on my shoulder. He goes, hey, kid. What's the name of your band? And I said, Joey Miserable and the Worms. And he looked at me like that. He goes, that ain't going to work here, kid. Dang it. Let me take care of you. Let me take care of you. So the, the curtain opens. And he goes, hey, everybody, we got a special surprise for you. We got Mikey and the boys. Now, the fucking... Uh, the fucking disco got shut off. The lights came on. So these people are already displeased with us because we interrupted their disco. They want to go to disco. They don't want no fucking rock and roll band. You know, for them, like, rock and roll. They hate rock and roll. They don't want to listen to that shit. They want their disco, you know. And uh, and we're up there in our goofy fucking, like, bowling shirts or whatever, you know. And they're looking at us like, ah, oh, fucking hell. Put the disco back on. So Mikey's like, you know. Hey, nothing but a hound dog, friend all the time. We ain't nothing but a hound. We do one song. Everybody's just giving us this death stare. Like, like nothing, not a sound. People, the guys are looking at us like they want to fucking kill us. They, they just want to fucking kill. Everybody's giving us a death stare, right? We play another song like Baby let me be your little teddy bear. I mean that's what this fucking Mikey guy sound like. Now they start throwing lit matches at us. Like and they start throwing ice cubes at us. And we're fucking playing, you know. 
So, and Mikey's like, everybody from the neighborhood knows Mikey, and they, they know Mikey Elvis, and they fucking hated him, right? So, like, then we go into a third song, and they just cut off the power, right? And I told the guys in the band, look, let's get the fuck out of here right now. You got no idea, okay? Like, I played this neighborhood for four years. You could just, you just know, you know, don't fuck with this shit. So we tried to get out there as fast as we could out the back door in the alley right by where the train yards are over there, you know. And we just got the fuck out of there. And we did get paid, actually. But, uh, man, to, I thought I was going to get fucking killed. All right? They wanted to fucking kill us, you know. Mikey Elvis, this little fucking motherfucker. Oh, I never saw him again, but thanks for the gig, Mikey.